As Kate mentioned, my name is Marianne Carter, and I got to meet Emily and work closely with her when I was the director of the Museum of Museums. And she created an incredible immersive installation called Sea of Vapors there. And a lot of that work is, has been translated and expanded and evolved into this show. Um, so we will be kind of referring to both Sea of Vapors and So Familiar just so that I can gauge how much backstory we need. Who got to see Sea of Vapors? Awesome. Cool. Great. Well, you're lucky. It was great, as is this. Um, Emily, I guess, will you talk about the creation of So Familiar and how it evolved out of Sea of Vapors and what it's like to adapt an installation of this scale? Well, um, so Sea of Vapors had a really specific narrative and direction that the figures were taking within the space. That show, if you didn't see it, it was more about a journey. And the figures were on a boat type of platform that was directed towards another space where the grandmother wizard queen was situated. So um, the, way, the way I had envisioned that show was um, yeah, more of an immersive experience, more of um, the type of environment that you're kind of drawn into because there was also a sound component and everything, including the walls, was considered. Um, but the idea with that body of work, or the hope, was to eventually be able to take the pieces and move them into new spaces for new exhibitions and um, Donna had suggested this space which was really exciting to me and I hope in general that the show and this body of work in general can travel um, but I had certain ideas that came up when I created <coughs> the show at the Museum of Museums um, you know some things that I wanted to expand upon like I had a few animal forms in that in that exhibition, and I was really interested in getting into that idea more of the familiars of these magical animals that are companions to the figures. Um, I wanted to shift the narrative to be specific for this space, to be um, specific for kind of. Well, the, the figures that are behind you, that are in the circle, I was thinking of putting them in a circle to create sort of this vortex of energy. <laughs> yeah. And in the first Museum of Museums situation, they were kind of looking out and in observation of their surroundings and in passage, and I had really thought it would be cool to place them in this sort of coven-like circle where they're drawing energy from each other and from their familiars and projecting that outward. Amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like narrative is a huge part of your work. I think when you arrive at this show, it's not just like, what does it mean? But like, what's the story here? Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the narrative of this show? And then I'd love to hear kind of how that ties into a greater meaning and this show as a reflection of you as an artist. Um, so first I'd say that the way I approach narrative is very um, shifty. <laughs> <laughs> and shifting, like within my own mind, I have these kind of loose ideas about what these figures are doing. But I'm also equally interested in the narratives that the viewers bring back to me or reflect to me when we're in conversation, um, or how they're perceiving what, what the figures are doing. Um, but I would say that with this with this figure, with the grandmother wizard queen, um, I really wanted her to be speaking about abundance and strength 
and she's surrounded by uh, the fruits and the flowers and these other objects. My thoughts were that the rest of the figures had brought these as gifts or people had been bringing these as offerings to her, but at the same time, she is, um, she is offering them as well. So it's kind of this two, two way feeling of abundance and giving gifts. That's and amazing. yeah, they're magical cool. gifts. They are very magical. And um, I feel like there's a lot of repeating themes in them. There's a lot of daggers, beautiful lipstick, fruit, flowers. Um, when we have spoken about it, you've talked about how those are kind of symbols that represent you in ways or yeah. um, kind of things you're thinking about just as you make. Do you want to speak to that? So. Yeah, the, the fruits and the flowers, um, I've been working with these kind of nature-based symbols for the past several years and they do have personal symbolism, but I think they're, it's also like, you know, they're universal symbols. Um, but for me, they have these kind of wilting, drooping moments within their stems and their petals, um, as I've been thinking a lot about the process of aging and finding the beauty and strength within, within that process as I'm, you know, shifting into a different part of my life in my mid to late forties, finding my body changing. So I've been thinking a lot about biological changes and really embracing the flowers and the fruits and that feeling of life cycles and abundance, growth, decay, transformation. Yeah, looking to that as sort of magical symbols. Um, and then the other symbolism, the, the lipstick, that's kind of um, something that came from my childhood. A lot of these symbols are um, representative of memories, childhood memories, things that I've been kind of obsessed with um, since I was a kid. And the lipsticks, that was, um, when I was little, I, th I thought of a lipstick as like the ultimate um, symbol of femininity <laughs> and being fancy. And so, and it was also like, it, it's kind of like an art material in that you can draw with it, you're drawing on your body with it. And because my, my mom didn't wear lipstick and it wasn't really something I saw around the house, it was even more like rare and special and just something that I saw on TV, basically in commercials. And <laughs> um, so when I was pretty little, like four or five, I asked my mom if I could be a tube of lipstick for Halloween. <laughs> and, she made me this really great costume. Um, but yeah, I've kind of like been coming back to that um, back and forth throughout my life. I'm trying to think of what else I can find else here. But there's some sort of, you know, personal connection that I have with like all the different um, objects that I'm making. And how do you, so we talked about narrative and symbolism. Um, obviously your command of a wide range of materials is just like incredible. Um, can you talk about your creative process? How do you go from having an idea and a memory of a tube of lipstick costume to setting up to make this scale of a show? Um, this, the drawing process is pretty key for me. I have a sketchbook and I'm using it all the time. Um, I think it's like one of the most important parts of my art practice, even though those drawings aren't something that I show. Um, when I'm there, when I'm drawing, everything's just sort of being pulled out of the ether through my fingers. I get surprises. <laughs> and, and then I try to stay true to that sketch, to those drawings. Um, but I think that there's a lot of mystery behind that process, um, which, I, which I like. I really like uh, the idea of artists having having visions 
and being able to pull something out of themselves, but out of, also out of like a collective energetic force or something. So when you say there's mystery, you mean like things are being revealed to you as you create these yeah. things. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't always know what, what's going to happen when I'm making the drawings. Um, and they're quick, they're, they're kind of, you know, not refined, but um, that, that moment of, you know, pulling this image or symbol or idea, you know, out of my subconscious mind and onto the page, um, it, that's just like a really important moment to, to my process because everything else needs to be so planned out when I'm making a sculpture. Um, I mean, there's discovery along the way, but a, a sculpture takes a lot of planning. In terms of like fitting in a kiln, maybe. Or yeah, it has to be this big. How are they going to fit together? You know, yeah, like how big is this going to be? How, how will it be constructed? Um, you know, a lot of logistics and formal decisions, but um, I think that drawing process is kind of like the, the most distilled form of creativity. With, and then the way that the lines come out on the page, I, I, I try to um, really grasp that, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but like retain something like that kind of like magic moment throughout the making of the sculpture. So when you see the final pieces, they look very much like the original drawing, even though it is quick. That's amazing. I feel like it translates beautifully, like as a viewer, when I look at your work, and I know I've told you this, I am like, okay, we're in another world, but it makes perfect sense. Like every single piece of it feels so intentional and it may be something that I've never seen or imagined, but at that moment, like I recognize it. Um, and a lot of that is I think you use, yeah, such a wide range of materials. Some of it is lighting, some of it's your two-way mirrors, um, but there's also such a sense of restraint and variety through your characters where they each are kind of awarded a couple of these elements. How do you decide that process or is it is that what you're referring to? Is it just kind of happening? Are you talking about the process of choosing materials for different? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. What drew you to start inter integrating like plexi? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that first started with just the interest in integrating illumination with ceramics. And I was originally using stained glass. Um, there was something about the limitation of an opaque material and the limitation of colors in terms of what um, is available with gla glazing. And so um, if I incorporate illuminated color or a translucent material or stained glass, um, then I have a different um, palette that's available to pair with the opaque, um, you know, ceramic glazes. So, and the same thing with the fabrics that I used in this show, I just, I had these ideas about color that aren't achievable as far as I know through glaze techniques. Um, and so all the velveteen I hand dyed because I was trying to achieve really specific colors. Um, yeah, so I think in some ways color was kind one of, of like, it, right, yeah, you know, the, the mm -hmm. um, but also I just, I, I do work with ceramics a lot, but I think of myself as a sculptor uh -huh. and not specifically a ceramicist. Makes sense. And yeah, it's evident in the I don't know soft sculpture that's incredible, and um, also sound is something that you've used both in Sea of Vapors and here. And that was a collaboration with your husband Josh yeah. and his project Party Store. Do you want to talk about uh, the significance of music as well as maybe that collaboration process? Yeah. Um, so. 
we had music playing before. There's, there is music that goes with this show. Um, that soundtrack is not collaborative, but it is one of his music projects. Going back to the show at the Museum of Museums, he and I collaborated on um, two sound pieces for that show. And mm, I've said this before, he calls it a collaboration, but I don't make music, so he did all the work. And I said, yeah, but different, like that. <laughs> um, but I, I had a, an emotional quality that I wanted, and I don't really, I don't make music, and I don't know how to make music, but through lots of back and forth and conversations, we came to these two sound pieces that went with that exhibition. Um, and I'm really interested in moving forward with <coughs> collaborating with him or other musicians because I love that um, that emotional depth that it brings to the art. Absolutely. I think it really contributes to this feeling of installation, which you've worked on. You've worked in installation for a long time. Um, what, what do, what's next? How do you see this continuing to evolve? So this body of work is going to shift, <coughs> move to Oregon Contemporary next fall. Um, it's going to open either in October or November. Uh, um, and I mean, everything's site specific to some extent. That space is very tall ceiling, so I like the idea of bringing the show up in a more vertical manner by making more hanging pieces, like these moth um, pieces that I sewed. And it's, it's just a bigger space in general, so I'll, I'll be adding figures. Um, in terms of the narrative, I do still like the idea of the, the circular format, um, but I'm thinking about expanding that. Um, making new familiars, new animals that will go with that exhibition. It's still kind of being planned out. Um, but yeah, I'm excited for that opportunity. Excellent. And it is worth mentioning, if you fall in love with one of these pieces, although there's it, this show's evolving, um, they are for sale. You can take one home. <laughs> um, it doesn't all have to stay together forever, but we'll yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the idea, is that some pieces have been selling. I, I really like the idea of it just shifting and gaining new pieces as it moves to new spaces. Yeah. Um, a question I have is, how, I feel so like charged by seeing your work, but how do you recharge after making a body of work like this? What in your routine gives you inspiration? Um, joy or rest and peace. <laughs> um, it, I don't know why this feels corny to say this, but it's just a really simple thing, but I get so much joy from my cats. <laughs> um, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I started making these, these pieces is because I I became a cat person late in life. I've had, I adopted two cats like two years ago and um, the way that they've changed my life is so profound. It's kind of wild to me because I have had pets in the past but I'm just like crazy about them. <laughs> and so, um, and I'm inspired by them every day. But that's how I recharge and rest is by like snuggling and taking naps. <laughs> it's a good life. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and for the show, it's, I mean, this, it's just, I guess it feels like a really universal thing to say. A lot of people have animal companions and they love them and they improve their lives. But I have been just thinking a lot about the, that human animal bond and um, the, like the emotional, lives of animals yeah that's beautiful um is there anything else you want to add that we haven't touched on before we open it up to questions um from the audience um I'm, i i love questions so yeah i think we should get into that all right um does anyone have any questions 
or Emily. Yes. Can you talk about the role and the significance of like eyes and mouth and orifices in your work? Yeah, um, so it's it's been a while now that I've been experimenting with this sort of reconfigured mixed up facial um, game that I'm sort of playing with myself. I, I love um, the rearrangement of, of the face because I'm always um, searching for an ideal or a new um, type of beauty that I can find within the face and no matter how you rearrange it, it still looks like a face, which is very interesting to me, even if it's like two mouths and, um, but in terms of like <laughs> orifices or holes, I also like the idea of this portal to the, to the mind or the heart or the soul. And a lot of times there's light on the inside where it's kind of a way to, emanate outwards or see, yeah, see what they're thinking, maybe. <laughs> um, the vampire mouth that is featured on a couple of the pieces that was more recent and in the same way as the spider symbolism that I've been using, it has this kind of dangerous nature to it that I was really drawn to, but it's it's also kind of like, it's fun, it's, it's kind of sexy, it's, it's scary, it's a little bit of everything, yeah. Who else has questions? Yes. Do you you say about the difference between ceramic and cloth for you, in that you sometimes, sometimes use them for the same purposes, but for different effects? Yeah, I mean, the, Soft sculpture is, I haven't worked with fabric very much um, during my career, so it's, it's new to me. And I think that um, having made a lot of these types of forms first with ceramic, that it was easier for me to translate those types of forms um, into, a, like into a sewn object. Um, it's I like seeing them juxtaposed. I, I like that hard, you know, breakable material right next to this like soft velvety or metallic. Um, yeah, I like the contrast. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like how I'm making them uh, physically, it's. In some ways, it's sort of just all the same to me because just um, I think of sculpture just like making a gingerbread house, just like put this together, put that together, there you go, it's done. And um, whether it's clay or fabric, it's kind of like I think about it the same way, mm -hmm. technically, I guess. Because <laughs> there's just all panels, really. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think it makes sense, but it also just shows how brilliant your mind is and how like fluid you are in that language well, I mean, that you're like, it's all the same to me. But it takes but it a lot more time than what you're saying. Than, I mean, it takes yeah. a lot of time. But when I'm looking at this now, I'm seeing, you know, the fabric pieces, they're made with panels, they're made with, and I work with slabs with clay. So those come from basically flat sheets of clay originally, and I'm just thinking how to make those into, you know, move that flat um, surface into a three-dimensional form. Yes. Congratulations, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you, I love when you can see the, like, two-dimensional uh, world done in three dimension, you know, when there are painters, sculptors, etc. I was wondering, like, how early building out this world started for you? Like, do you have middle school notebooks where the marginalia looks a little bit like the beginnings of these characters. And could you walk us through like your first inkling of this world? Um, 
I'll, I think I'll get lost if I think back about middle school, but um, <laughs> the, I have, I, I was working with in installation, um, going back to like to the year 2000. Um, and um, in 2006, I made an installation that was life-size self-portrait sculptures. And it was the first time that I, there's actually a lot of similarities in some ways to, to this show and that um, just, in that I was combining fabric with ceramics for the first time. And, and that was sort of, um, yeah, a, a turning point for me. But um, I, I've gone through ups and downs in terms of um, working with rep representational forms or I went through kind of an abstract phase with sculpture. So I don't know, it's kind of, it, I'd say that <laughs> there's a lot of symbolism and ideas in this show that I can trace back to like the early 2000s mm -hmm. um, or like I was talking about the lipsticks that's something yeah. that I've been like going back to since I was a kid and um, yeah some, some of the other symbolism here but um, really everything started growing in my mind specifically for the show, not until um, I knew that I was going to do the exhibition at the mom. Mm -hmm. And then there's like, there's lots and lots of drawings that go behind that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, it's all an evolution. Like, uh, the figures with the lights in their faces, I was originally doing a series of telephones that were glowing, and there's, there's one um, on that platform back there but that was like the first piece that I made that was illuminated from the inside that was maybe 10, 12 years ago. Um, so yeah, there's, there's seeds everywhere. <laughs> are they're self-portraits but they're also portraits of my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my mother and my best friend who passed away so they're all um, really important people that shaped my life that were women in my life as and then also myself and there's just little bits of all of them and of me in each piece either energetically or um, something about the hair or the stance or the way they're holding their hands. Um, and this one especially, like, I feel like when I look at her, I can see my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my mom. They're all, they're all there in some way. Um, so it's it's very personal, but it's yeah, it's also about um, find, finding these these female figures that embody strength and creativity and um, artistic energy and power, but um, we were talking about this, that like power is this word that I'm never quite comfortable with, but yeah, I hope that they're powerful figures in a, in a, a gentle way. Um, and then this larger figure who is kind of like the destination of all of 
ever, all the others in the exhibition. Um, she kind of like represents that in a very like exaggerated and strong and kind of electric manner. But she's holding the spider inside of her, which is um, representing that need to always be building and moving and creating with the hands. So it's kind of like an artistic essence that comes from the gut. The inner mastery of different materials and unusual ways, you know, to bring these um, these images into a really full expression is just wonderful to see. And um, I don't sew, I don't know anything about any of that, but I, I wonder how, like, some of these you have for the soft sculpture, you have these beautiful scenes, you know, that have a kind of, you know, a quality that really talks with the materials. And then for others, like, like on this uh, figure sculpture here, it's flatly attached. And I was just curious, well, how you make your decisions about all that, um, if it's kind of intuitive. And, and then I'm just curious, how do you attach? You're talking about the pattern on the velveteen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> That was, that was sort of like the trickiest part of the whole exhibition in a way, me mentally, <laughs> because I just couldn't, I knew I wanted a pattern on this velveteen and I couldn't figure out how to, how to do it. So I just had a lot of trial and, and error. Like, am I gonna sew tassels on it? Is, is it gonna be something that I embroider <clears throat> or paint or, but um, I've been working with the velveteen and, and I had all this lame, which um, is a type of fabric that normally frays really easily. Um, but I just figured out a way to put a, an, um, like an iron-on adhesive backing onto the lame and then I cut out all the shapes by hand and then they're heat set onto the velveteen. Um, and I was hoping it would almost look like a screen printed foil process. Um, but I just, it, that was kind of tricky because it, I was more working more experimentally and I didn't know how to get <laughs> what I was going for. Yeah, it took a little, a little while. Yes. I have a question about your materials as well. The work is so beautiful, especially with the sewn pieces and the lighting. I love the lighting. Uh, but it seems like the fabric and then the lighting and then the ceramics, the glazed fire ceramics, they all have different lives over time. And I wonder if you thought about that. Are you talking about, like, from an archival yes. standpoint? Yeah. Like, what's, um, yeah, it's really interesting because that's why I've always been drawn to ceramics is it's so en enduring. Um, but then I think maybe Donna and I have talked about this where if I accidentally drop one of the fabric pieces on the floor, it's it's actually going to be okay. <laughs> and I have broken a lot of my pieces. Um, so they, they have different insurance policies. <laughs> yeah, or they just have different um, lifespans depending on how you treat them. Um, and I think in the end, I, I'm always going to maybe love ceramics the most because like I always thought if this falls off of a boat and it lands at the bottom of the ocean it might be okay and someone might find it in several hundred years and or you'll, you'll get the idea you know um, the colors may still be there and I, I just love that about ceramics but 
making the soft sculptures is just, it's so fun and it's nice to be able to squeeze something. And, um, but you, I, I do think about that. You probably have to worry a little more about the care. Yeah. Curious. But it's, it's just like a, the variety of, you know, I, I love the tactile nature of materials and that variation is really satisfying to me, yeah. I wanted to just um, say how beautiful the shadow play behind this figure is and, and that it's like just layering one more very ephemeral thing. But the color of it is uh, exquisite and uh, anyway, I'm just sitting here looking at that orange and pink shadow that's like, you know, three or four layers of it. And, how much that's adding to the whole magical thing that is really beautiful. Um, Donna is so good at lighting, and Studio E has <laughs> such a cool lighting system. It was really fun for us to, like it was really magical to me when she was up on the ladder, how about this, how about this? And, yeah, I mean, that's Donna. <laughs> yeah, you should, you yeah. should take that with you. It's yeah. really good. But I, I mean, it was really the, the shadows, the, and I was hoping for kind of like a sunset um, palette mm -hmm. behind her. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, yeah, I was also really happy with how that turned out. Um, I, think, I just have a question about your, you were saying you do a lot of sketching, and I was just curious about what you draw with in your sketchbook, whether it's, like, I, I just have one pen, I always use the same pen, but I was wondering if you use color, or um, especially because your work is so involved with color, like, what does that book look like? It's usually just black ink, yeah, and so then reserving the color choices for later, that's where I have like the second, um, t I don't know, the second moment of like a lot of creativity. Yeah. Uh, I was just gonna ask uh, if you could talk a little bit more about your color palette, um, just cause it's so expansive, but also like very tight and specific. Like how did you come to create your color palette? Um, it's been shifting. It's always shifting. Um, it wasn't really that long ago that I was just working in black and white and gray. No, actually it was, it was nine years ago, but um, it's changed so much over the years and I've just, I've landed in, in this moment, we were just talking about this where um, like mauve and orange are really satisfying to me, and I'm, I don't really know why. Um, lipstick. What's that? Lipstick. Lipstick colors. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 totally. Um, but I don't know. I've been looking at um, this like old West German pottery and they have all these like great like vermilion vibrant oranges mixed with purples and I just, I don't know, there's certain combinations that are really lovely to me and I'm always trying to get, I don't know, get to something that I find beautiful and um, I'm always chasing beauty with color and it's it's difficult because once I land on it um, I'll usually change my mind um, well thank you Emily and thanks everyone for coming out if you got in here while it was packed and have not enjoyed the show um, make sure you check it out there's such exquisite detail in every piece um, when does the show close the 23rd all right it's open till the 23rd um, and yeah, is there anything coming next for you that you want to promote or mention? How can people stay in touch? Um, Instagram or my email. Yeah. 
Um, I'll be in a group show in Brussels at Schoenfeld Gallery in uh, ne next month. Yeah, and that's what's next. That's so exciting. Yeah. Um, Marianne, thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to have a conversation with you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It means a lot to me.